There are years that have brought political chaos to Nigeria, others profound despair. But for the first time since perhaps 1999, this year, 2022, brought hope of real change in this country in 2023. It was a year that Nigerians really started to ask hard questions of their leaders and of those who hoped to lead. It was a year that awakened Nigeria's youth to the power of their vast numbers and the belief that they could send this country in a new political direction. A year in which they've sought to find new champions of change, hopefully for better, not worse, amid deepening divisions, dwindling revenues and rising poverty. Tonight, along with a panel of expert analysts, we look back at the political events that have shaped 2022, weaving together the strands of a year in which Nigerians sought answers and sought to put their politicians to the test as they look ahead to pivotal elections in 2023. I'm Charles Anyagolu and this is a special edition of Arise Primetime. So tonight, I'll look back at the record of the political events that shaped Nigeria in 2022 and could set the tone for crucial elections in 2023. And who could ever forget the rise of the so-called obedience in 2022, all set in motion by the decision of the former governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi, to leave his old party, the PDP, for a new one, the Labour Party, and to declare his 2023 presidential bid under its flag, promising to move Nigeria from consumption to production. Cumulatively, the Human Development Index we are 163 over 191. And this situation, like you've mentioned, is unacceptable and calls for one thing, the great escape. As mentioned by Nobel Prize winner in 2015 in economics, Angus Dutton of Princeton, the difference between rich and poor nation is health and education. So how do you tackle this? You tackle it by investing in this critical area. Meanwhile, Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, or PDP, also declared his presidential bid, promising to restructure Nigeria and fix the economy in a way that would help it achieve sustainable development. As a developing country, Nigeria's mainstay as far as employment is concerned, it's agriculture. As far as employment is concerned. We must revolutionize our agricultural sector to make sure that it employs as many young men and women as possible. And the only way you can do that is to make sure that incentives are given again to the private sector to expand you know, uh, the agricultural base uh, of the country. And Rabiu Kwankwaso, the presidential candidate of the New Nigeria People's Party, or NNPP, pledged to tackle insecurity by using technology to strengthen the armed forces and to recruit 750,000 new personnel into their ranks. We have an issue of insecurity, which is also very important. Our situation in Nigeria whereby people cannot go to the farm, people cannot buy and sell from point B to point C because of insecurity and so on. All these uh, issues aggravated uh, the issue of poverty in this country. And I'm even surprised that uh, we're talking of 133 million people. If you talk to roadside economists, uh, people who do it practically, not necessarily the MBS, will always tell you that uh, the number is much more than 133 million. But in any case, our responsibility is to ensure that there is security in this country. And not to be outdone, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, the presidential candidate of the ruling All Progressives Congress, or APC, promised renewed hope in 2023 and an action plan for a better Nigeria that he said would carry every Nigerian along. It's all about service. 
It's nothing else. Think wisely, get committed to your thinking, and serve to serve the nation, and uh, bring progress and prosperity to the lives of Nigerians. It's good for the country, for for so many of us to aspire to want to lead. We are not abandoning our nation. There is, of course, a second tier of 14 political parties all competing for the top job. And if Nigeria's politics is to evolve in a positive direction in 2023, then the role of these smaller parties could be crucial, especially as improvements in the Electoral Act and the dynamics of the voting system suggest that the playing field has become considerably more level. Meanwhile, each of the front-runner parties all claim to be favoured to win in 2023, but each had issues in 2022. In the PDP, a civil war threatened to tear the party apart, even as negotiations with the rebel group remained stalled. In the Labour Party, the Director General of the presidential campaign was forced to resign over a money laundering conviction. And in the APC, a visit to Chatham House in London raised questions about the capacity of their candidate. But for the NNPP, well, there were no issues at all, according to its vice presidential candidate. Until uh, my principal, Dr. Rabi Musa Konkoso, stepped in eight, nine months ago and rejigged it and brought life much more into it. And within the shortest possible time, nook and cranny of this country began to feel the impact of NNPP. Notwithstanding, we have so much to do in the shortest time. The structures are there, and like I did say before, those who really undermine us are, you know, that's their own peril. We are in need to win it. We are galvanizing. We are, we are motivating. And the factors surrounding us suggest to us that other parties must have failed and uh, needing somebody who has been tested, proven, worth of, worthy of people believing in that, is able to do what he has said based on antecedents. I have a mentor. I have a principal in the person of Dr. Rabbi Musa Kwankoso. Well, beyond the apparently mild-mannered NNPP, the stage was set for a bruising battle on the hustings for everyone else as the Electoral Commission INEC pulled the trigger for the official start of the campaign in late September 2022 and Nigeria advanced inexorably towards the final stretch. And to help us take a closer look at the highs and lows as 2022 gradually empties into 2023, I'm joined now by our panel of experts. The noted sophologist, Professor Jibreen Ibrahim, Senior Fellow at West Africa's most comprehensive election analysis think tank, the Center for Democracy and Development. The Executive Director of Development Specs Academy, member of the editorial board of This Day newspaper and Professor of Strategic Management and Human Capital Development, Dr. Oke Ikechuku and the policy strategist, Arise News Analyst, and founder and executive director of Agora Policy, Waziri Adio. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us. So let me start with you, Professor Ibrahim. Where do you think Nigeria is now politically versus where it was at the beginning of this year? I think uh, we are what, where we can consider to be an interesting place in the sense that for the first time in our history we are having a long and bruising uh, campaign period and the length of the campaign period is bringing a lot of issues out that would not have arisen normally because the campaigns would have been uh, rather short but i think for me the most important thing is that the crisis in the country itself is becoming deeper at a time in which the main campaigners appear to be unable to respond in terms of solution proposals to the depth of the problem. Nigeria is essentially bankrupt. 
regional and ethnic, including religious tensions, are extremely high. And I do not see enough proposals that appear to be leading to solutions. And I am therefore a bit worried about where we are headed as a nation. Well, thank you very much indeed for that summary. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Professor Ike Chuku. Uh, has this country evolved politically in 2022 the way you expected it to evolve or the way you hoped it would evolve? The answer is no. <clears throat> if you talk of evolution in terms of development, measurable development in indicating steady progress and in some cases irreversible progress, and when you say politically, you're talking about the political process, the electoral process, the quality of people competing for public office, how they conduct themselves, the kind of policy debates that are associated with it. No, it's not good enough. It can be much better. But looking at it more closely and speaking strictly to the issue you raised, we must ask ourselves, the parties that are gone in for office, what is it that they are putting on the table? There is a ruling party. What is this record in all the FDIs, you know, HDIs rather, national security, state of the economy, um, national consciousness in terms of patriotism as against ethnic consciousness, the quality of people holding public office, the monetization of um, politics and leadership, that's on the part of the sitting government, talking about evolution and also how their candidates emerged and what they charged for nomination, which effectively disenfranchised most Nigerians from even aspiring. Then you come to the second party, the one that lost and which is deemed to be the uh, major opposition party, was in power for 16 years. It's hoping to come back, but it has such internal issues that it's an absolute miracle that it expects people to take it seriously. A party that wants to take over from a ruling government and it's not asking itself, what is the electoral, electoral value of the chairman on account of whom we are shooting at each other? Is he likely to secure all the votes? Will we lose all the votes if we have him out? And then, of course, the processes and other issues linking uh, uh, around that. The obedient movement is also there, Kokwanso is there. So st um, speaking generally, and perhaps strictly also in terms of evolution, political evolution revolves around certain clear indices or pillars the overall quality of the electoral process, discussions revolving around problem solving, but from the angle of governance issues and policies, are they being debated? Uh, much of the conversation you have, where it is even looking serious, is about physical infrastructure. What's the quality of the human person in Nigeria? What's the conversation about education? A nation that now lives mostly on palliatives and um, remedial, short-term remedial interventions, a nation where all the roads, practically all federal roads, are still bad, you ask yourself, what kind of political process? An election, yes. Does it translate into greater political maturity? I have my doubts. INEC may hold some prospect of a clean process going by the beavers that look, if the beavers walk and nobody abuts it, at least the outcome will be what the people who voted want to be the outcome. Whether with that outcome it translates into a more mature polity and a lead that is more responsible is open to argument. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. And let me come to you, Waziri Adio, as we try to set out the broad strokes of the big issues um, in 2023. What, in your assessment, have been those big political issues in Nigeria this year. And how do you think those issues will play out in 2023? Uh, thank you very much. I want to start by saying that um, I slightly disagree with uh, my senior and eminent uh, panelists. Um, the year 2022 has, has lived out its billing as a pre-election year. And as you know, this is an election that is landmark uh, in many ways. So this is a year that has been full of surprises, uh, full of excitement, and um, we're you know, primed for an election that could be the most competitive election that we have had 
uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, this, in this dispensation. I hope you guys can hear me. Can, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, you know, uh, and it's likely to be the most competitive election um, in, since 1999, and an election that's uh, likely to be as competitive as the one of 1979, where we had um, five main candidates, and uh, the, the, the candidate that um, eventually won uh, secured 3% of the votes, and the candidate that came second secured 29%, and the one that came third uh, secured 16% uh, of the votes. Uh, if you compare that with what we have had uh, since 1999 to date, uh, you find out that we don't have a third party uh, securing even up to 10%. Uh, so that's likely to change this time around. The second thing also is that um, there's so much excitement in the air uh, that um, it's so difficult to call the election now. Um, it used to be a two-way horse race and it's likely to be a four-way or even an 18-way horse race this time around. Uh, but in terms of, of the, the larger issues, uh, the issues for, for 2023, uh, there are so many issues that will be in contention. Uh, the first one is that um, there's a contest between the traditional way of doing politics and the new or emerging way of doing politics. Um, also, there's greater consciousness among the youth and the belief that votes um, you know, will count more this time around. I think sometimes when we say, Votes that didn't count in the past. I, I don't think we have been fair enough to ourselves. Um, yes, um, there were attempts here and there, but the results of the elections, apart from even the one of 20, 2007, uh, the result would not have been otherwise um, if, if the election had been, had been more open and more free and fair. Uh, so we're likely to see so many things tested in this election, and um, we look forward to 2023 to see how it, it plays out. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Waziri. And just coming off the back of that, Professor I Ibrahim, uh, you've had a look, you're the noted sophologist, you've had a look at the manifestos of the parties. What's your assessment of their plans? Do you think that they mark a step forward for Nigeria and for politics in this country? You know, I usually read manifestos and what I've found over the past three elections is that the quality of manifestos of leading political parties in this country have improved considerably. I became interested on in what is the basis for this improvement. And what I found out is that the parties are able to assemble the best brains in the economy in politics, in society, to produce an excellent document that they present to Nigerians as the basis on which they are contesting. My inquiries revealed further that apart from a few crazy people like me, nobody else actually reads these manifestos and that they are supposed to be beautiful documents to adorn your sitting room with rather than a document uh, for work. The reality of a manifesto in terms of my own discipline of political science is supposed to be a deep conversation from the, within the parties where party leaders consult with the grassroots and from that grassroots consultation are able to map out what are the key challenges party members want to be addressed if they win power and how would they address it and above all what are the issues to be given priority when you talk to party members in this country of course most of them have not even seen the manifestos not to talk of reading it but more important nobody has actually consulted them on what their concerns are. So uh, because I've taken the time to look at manifestos, I will just say they are indeed beautiful documents, but are they really part of the political debate? And, and that's a very crucial point. And uh, coming off uh, the back of that, Professor Ike Chuku, looking at the 
sophistication of these manifestos that Professor Ibrahim was talking about? Do you think they balance their promises with how they intend to deliver on their pledges? You find that many of the proposals are also disconnected with the ground. So as what they'll use to work, and I keep, I've cited this example a couple of times, a lot of them are planning to do many things about agriculture. They're hoping to increase um, irrigation. Nobody is taking account of the fact that the volume of water coming in, coming down the Niger all the way has depleted by 68%. And the more you dam, the less water you have going down. Nobody is doing a comprehensive evaluation to know that the local job flooding is no magic. That for more than 20, 30 years, people have been building where there used to be dry land. But the taking away of the water through so many dams has created the illusion of dry land. And so what are we talking about? A perception of how to, a document of how to manage Nigeria in 2023 with a very limited understanding of three key issues. What a political party is, the relationship between a written manifesto and the action, the first and every line of action a government will take. And thirdly and finally, a holistic understanding and approach to the governance process. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Ike Chukwu. And uh, Waziri Adio, I don't know if you agree or disagree with those assessments so far, but do you see those manifestos as giving Nigerians hope, real hope, that their prospective leaders now have a blueprint by which they can be held to account? Okay, I think a number of things. Uh, the first one is that um, I agree with the uh, submission that um, uh, we have more quality or seemingly more qualitative um, manifestos now. Um, and one of the things that we can say about this particular year is that almost um, all the major parties have come up with manifestos. This is also novel. Um, if you look at 1999 to date, um, you know, Politicians usually say that, you know, nobody reads manifestos, nobody, nobody cares about that. That's not how elections are won here. Uh, but because of the increased competition, uh, all the major parties, you know, have manifestos now. Um, but um, quantity is not the same thing as quality. Um, and while I agree with uh, the fact that they make, um, you know, all kind of promises, uh, when you, when you stretch when you scratch beneath the surface, uh, most of these, most of these uh, manifestos are just, um, are just platitudes. Uh, they tell you about different things they want to do. Uh, most of them are not realistic targets that they are setting. Like somebody saying you will double uh, refining petroleum, refining capacity uh, within a year of being in office. So anybody that knows how long uh, it takes uh, to build a refinery, uh, we know that that is not possible. Um, some of them will tell you that they're going to spend X amount of GDP uh, for, for education or for health. And you're saying, do you even know how much that means? You know, but beyond that, when you look at these manifestos, they're just general statement of intentions. They don't tell you, they tell you things they want to do, but they don't tell you exactly how they're going to do them. In fact, some of them read more like commentaries. Um, they tell you, oh, the economy is bad, there's no security, uh, you know, we don't export enough and all of that. You know, I always say, no, you're a presidential candidate. Um, tell us what you're going to do. We all know the problems. It's good for you to tell us that you know what the problems are. But what we want to hear from you is what you intend to do about the problem um, and, and what your policy prescriptions are and how you are going to face those policy prescriptions and also how you are going to fund them. Um, it's, 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 it's not enough to just say, oh, you are going to achieve balanced budget uh, in an economy where the budget is running at more than 50% deficit. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to pay for that? You know, so we need you know, more depth. Uh, we need, um, and like uh, Prof said, um, at the electionary period, a manifesto, uh, both of them are supposed to be deep conversation, not just within the party, but with the country. Uh, and, but if you are having this conversation at a superficial level, uh, you are just talking about what you think people want to hear. And also, some of them are not talking about the tough decisions that we need to take as a country. Um, so I'm not, um, yes, there are people who get excited about some of these things, but when you look uh, deeply and when you come from a policy perspective, you see that um, 
uh, is still politics as usual. And um, we're not talking about, there are some, whoever takes over next year uh, is going to inherit a very difficult country and we have to take some very critical decisions. And the earlier we start talking about those decisions, especially those that will inflict pains on people who are already uh, pressed, right? At the moment, the earlier we start talking about them, uh, the better for all of us as a country. Very good points there and very good points all around. And let me just mention that if we all sound a little bit nasally, it's because we've all got a little touch of the sniffles. Nobody's escaped it. Nigeria is going through a period of harmatan. Uh, at the moment. But gentlemen, thank you for the moment. Uh, you're watching our year in review on this special edition of Arise Primetime. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our look back at the political events that shaped Nigeria in 2022 and could set the tone for crucial elections in 2023. Stay with us. Welcome back to this special edition of Arise Primetime as we look back at the political events that shaped Nigeria in 2022 and could set the tone for 2023. I'm Charles Anyagolu. So after the epic political journey of 2022 ends, what happens in 2023? Well, that journey is far from over because the election in the first quarter of the new year is just the midpoint of a tortuous course. The hardest part is waiting for what happens next in a journey of promises as Nigerians wait for the 2023 ballot and hope that they can finally get started on a better future. And with me in the studio to help unpack all that, the noted sophologist, Professor Jibreen Ibrahim, Senior Fellow at West Africa's most comprehensive election analysis think tank, the Center for Democracy and Development, the Executive Director of Development Specs Academy, member of the editorial board of This Day newspaper, and Professor of Strategic Management and Human Capital Development, Dr. K. E. K. Chuku, and the policy strategist, Arise News Analyst, and founder and executive Executive Director of Agora Policy, Waziri Adio. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for staying with us and for your sterling contributions so far. We've got another half an hour to go and we're looking forward to uh, get your analysis um, of, of the other things that we're going to be talking about. And starting with you, Professor Ibrahim, looking back at 2022, a big part of the political process was getting people to know what the politicians do and say and what impact that has. I mean, we're talking about manifestos and, you know, the, the, the hustings and all the rest of it. Do, do you think the understanding of the average Nigerian of politics and democracy is better now than at previous elections? That's a very difficult question. And the reason it's difficult is because we live in an information overload society where there's so much information out there for people, uh, bombarding people, and absorbing all that becomes a problem. But that's not even where the deep problem is. The real problem is that alongside the information bombardment, is also misinformation and disinformation bon bombardment so that it becomes increasingly difficult for the ordinary Nigerian to make a distinction, uh, an assessment rather, of what they are hearing and seeing to establish <coughs> whether there is a veracity in what's being said or whether it's make-believe that has been concocted. And the area of misinformation and disinformation has become so advanced that even for specialists, it becomes difficult sometimes to know whether something is real or not. Any society where the distinction between truth and falsehood, what exists and what doesn't exist, becomes fuzzy, is in deep trouble because what that means is that the whole of democracy relies on one fact that people get information on what's happening and not happening and on that basis they make decisions of providing support or withdrawing support to political authority 
when now the information they are receiving, they themselves are unable to establish its veracity or lack of, then they are unable to play their role as citizens who will now assess the information before them, before them and act on their understanding of that information. So we live in this contemporary uh, information overload where the overload is not just on information but also on disinformation. Set up world. That's a very good point, and, and that's something I think that's very <coughs> important to bear in mind as we go forward. Uh, Professor E. K. Chiku, beyond the, the citizens themselves, what about the politicians? Have they become more responsible um, because perhaps they perceive that the demands of the people are, are getting sort of tougher as they go forward. They're demanding more of their, of their politicians. Do you see signs among the front runners, for example, that they are now more responsive and, and more ethical? I mean, or, or are they just blundering through as we've seen sometimes in the past? I think probably a combination of both. And uh, going back to what Prof said about information overload, I think we may want to try the concept of misfortune overload. Insecurity at the lowest and highest levels. People are worrying about daily survival. So even when we are talking about misinformation and disinformation, the question is actually whether the people are paying attention to any kind of communication across the country. But let's assume they are paying attention. The other question to ask is between 1999 and today, has the electricity supply in the country improved to the extent that if you choose to use all the media that you will access more Nigerians? No. The bulk of them are without electricity. The reflexes of the political leaders, do, does it suggest that they are in greater consultations with the people? The answer is no. So to that extent, whatever little information is being put together and put out is actually most of the time what I call incestuous communication, wherein the speaker is the target of his own communication. He assesses himself. He puts out adverts in the newspapers to announce what the presidential candidate is saying. The newspaper has 46% unsold, and the total copy before the unsold was less than a million. How many Nigerians got it? But on the politicians themselves, the substantive matter you raised, I think we'll have to use some specifics to assess that. Are they seem to be going more frequently to consult with their people? In my experience, in my own part of the country, the answer is no. Are they seem to be very active at the natural, national or superstructural level? I think the answer is yes. Negotiations, conspiracies. This man is angry. Let's make him happy. We are constituting the campaign. So tell uh, um, Mecca to bring 15 people. We will ask Musa to bring 19 of his boys. That is going on, and that's not where what's taking us anywhere. So looking at all of it together then, if you say this is designed to win elections, the concern will then be what manner of elections. How can this template be what will be used to draw Nigerians? And so you find that at the elite level, if you ask me, political, um, the degree of political sophistication has this improved? I am not sure it has. At the level of the average person, do you see greater indications of limited political literacy? Yes and no. Yes, because the same reflexes are going on. No, because the people are now more noisy. Not in terms of looking for trouble, but they are feeling the pinch so badly they are saying, hey, hey, listen, I, I should be interested in taking decisions in this matter. I have, I have something to gain or lose. I need to be more involved. So at the level of the political elite, I am not convinced. I may be wrong. Looking at all they are doing, the parties, the movements, the traveling up and down, is still an elite engagement. The template is still the same. We'll go to negotiate with this person. I mentioned the other time, I think on air, when the PDP team went to Bauchi State to speak with a major stakeholder who is the governor. And um, oh, the campaign uh, director then informed Nigerians that, look, we went to Bauchi to sort out all the gray areas. We're all happy. Two days later, the man they went to see whom they said was happy opened fire on everybody. And so you move to the APC, too many spokespersons, all of them, you know, there's a, there's a need for a greater refinement in the presentation. You move to the Labour Party, there's a lot of mass following, but there's also need for some ideological encourage beyond the candidate himself. 
and ANPP, well, probably NNPP. why... NNPP. NNPP, sorry. Yeah. Probably why there's no controversy, really. Why he's not having any problem is that I, for one, I don't know what he represents other than that what was so is contesting. So if you're contesting and there's no clear idea of what it is you represent, I don't see why anybody should quarrel with you. Well, that's a very interesting angle. And staying with that theme of the politicians, uh, Waziri Adia, do you think they now realize that Nigeria isn't working and never would without radical change and that they are the ones who have a responsibility to effect that change? I think the first place to start is that um, this long campaign period is tasking everyone. Um, you know, we used to campaign, or you know, the campaigns used to be for two to three months, um, and the politicians uh, seem to have, um, you know, adapted themselves to, to, to the dynamics of that. But now that they had to campaign for eight to nine months, um, it's, 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 it needs getting used to. And uh, it's a lot of time, uh, requires a lot of effort and a lot of resources. So I think they are trying to pace themselves um, to, to, to make sure that they don't run out of, um, out of what they are saying. They also do not run out of resources. I think we're going to see the re-campaigns uh, when we come back in the new year. And uh, most of it will be concentrated, in my view, um, in the last mile, which will be in February. Right? Uh, but um, yes, uh, depending on how uh, you see yourself, uh, the, the candidates have also been behaving true to type. Uh, if, you are the, um, if you are the challenger, right, um, you have the incentive uh, to be more active and to demarket you know, the, 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 the leading candidates. And if you're also the leading candidate, um, you have the incentive uh, not to surrender the momentum, uh, not to surrender advantage. You know. so, and campaigns happen at different levels. Uh, there's the one that people uh, or parties do uh, in, in stadia, you know, um, uh, in, in all those big places. Uh, there's the one that they do uh, uh, with the media. Uh, but there's also the other ones that they do at different levels. Uh, so don't let us just focus on the candidates. Um, you have other people who are also campaigning for them at the state level and are also at the local government level. So. I think um, a lot is going on, um, and the politicians are behaving true to type. Uh, in terms of um, do they think um, uh, something has changed, I think I sense uh, um, greater competition, a sense of competition, and they are responding to that. And on the basis of that, you know, we're seeing you know, a lot of movements you know, here and there. Uh, but politicians during an election, almost everyone except the one in the ruling party, uh, we we'll say, you know, the, 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 we need to change how we run things. Um, it's a different thing for the person in the ruling party. Uh, you can't say, you know, you are going to change, you know, how you run things. Uh, the election is going to be a referendum on the ruling party, even when uh, it's an open election, when the incumbent himself is not running. Uh, so it's, it's, there's also a very delicate um, uh, line there that, um, you know, you want to say uh, you continue to do uh, what the, 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 the incubate is doing, but at the same time, you also want to differentiate yourself from the incubate uh, to show that you do better. So that's, that's, that's some, you know, some kind of dilemma that they have to struggle with. But on the whole, I think um, it has been an interesting election so far. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, interesting year so far. And um, I think um, we should look forward to 2022 uh, when we you know, um, race towards the finishing line. And uh, obviously, you mean 2023 there, and and that actually <laughs> that actually brings me to that. That makes us sort of segue nicely from 2022 into 2023 and beyond uh, 2022, uh, Professor Ibrahim. When you look beyond that uh, year into the approaching year, what do you see politically in Nigeria? How do you imagine? the future and are you inspired by it or do you despair of it well a new <coughs> president will emerge in may having made huge promises about how to solve all of nigeria's problem and their first discovery whoever emerges 
would be that the country is essentially bankrupt, that there isn't even money to pay the salaries of civil servants, not to talk of capital projects, and that everything is based on increasing the debt. 2023 will be the year where it will no longer be possible to even service the debt that we have. And they'll have to borrow more money just to service the debt, which means the process of governance will become a real crisis. At this point, I'll go back to the big story for me of 2022, which was a tweet by Elumelu in March. Tony Olimolu, yes, right. who the runs entrepreneur, yeah, and, um, who is chairman of UBA. Yes, and he, he did this tweet that went viral and changed realities about this country, which was he was talking about a specific oil terminal in Boni, where ninety-five percent of the oil production was stolen, and the oil company was only benefiting from five percent. This reverses completely the nature of theft because the normal thing is to steal 5% and the owner still has 95%. When I saw that tweet in March this year, I thought it was a joke. A week later, NMPC confirmed it. Yes, out of the 200,000 barrels produced in Boni, only 5% goes to the oil company. Now, two things emerged after that revelation. One was that Tony Elumelu himself had just bought an oil well based on bank loans, and to his shock found out most of the oil was being stolen, and he was himself unable to service his debts. And that was a big uh, shocker. But the big shocker was when the NMPC then subsequently organized this big road show where they were showing us all the pipes, sophisticated pipes, where mega ships were coming to steal Nigeria's oil. And then the big question was, how come this is the biggest national security and existential threat that Nigeria has faced in its history as a rentier economy, completely dependent on petroleum, and most of the petroleum is stolen, and it's not the number one news in the country. And all the government That's agencies who are involved, the NMPC wasn't saying anything. The security forces were not uh, talking about it. The government itself that was being forced to take us down the path of the debt trap because the oil was being stolen wasn't talking about it. And what that showed us, and for me that's really the big story of this transition, is that they were all implicated in this theft. And had this gentleman not done Nigeria the great service of saying, look, they are stealing all our oil, we would have waited till May next year when the pr new president will found out he's been sold a dummy and that there was nothing to govern with. Therefore, coming back to 2023, the challenge for the incoming government is this tradition where there's massive theft, most government agencies are part of that massive theft, and that therefore addressing that theft becomes very difficult because those who are to stop the theft are themselves part of the gang of thieves, and that therefore the biggest challenge is how do you transform these agencies from gangs of thieves to patriotic Nigerians that will truly serve the nation. Huge challenge, I assure you. Absolutely, and, and that's a big question that will confront any government that comes in in 2023. But of course, before that government comes in, Professor Ike Chuku, the big challenge is getting through the election that will get them in. Come February and March 2023, when the general election takes place, what do you predict about how it's all going to go? Do you predict that it's all going to be 
smooth sailing and for example on the presidential level a victor will emerge untrammeled or do you see an impending as someone put it apocalypse of chaos and disputes and perhaps worse or, or something in between well i expect that the president will eventually emerge but let's look at the crisis littering the road leading to that emergence this is christmas what percentage of Nigerians refused to go home out of fear? Um, for our brothers and sisters from the north, is it true that for some parts of the north, sometimes up to 20, 30 percent of a state, that some people have not gone home for more than a year, for more than two years? So let's look at the potholes on the way to the elections. Farmers, even those who borrowed money from the uh, CBN under the Anchor Borrowers Program, many of them industrial, massive farmlands, they couldn't harvest because bandits took over the place. So they've lost their money. There's no increased food production. Then at the level of physical infrastructure, there are no roads. At the level of national cohesion, people speak of my area. At the level of political consciousness, you hear all manner of conversations. And we're heading towards 2023, and you find what looks like a progressive balkanization of national consciousness, distortion of the core elements of political preparedness towards 2023, and therefore, the likelihood that if there is an election, and I expect and hope there will be one, there may or may not be a straight win. If there is no straight win, there will be a runoff. That runoff may give us a better chance of choosing whom we want because that runoff will then very likely be on more like on the question of the total majority. But you see, the Nigerian state has to be in existence until the date of that election and thereafter. And do we see a retreating state? The answer is yes. And that's where the real concern is. Some people came to Abuja here, went to Kuje prisons and released inmates. Now, that's a 25 minutes drive to the president's residence. 22 minutes drive to the Supreme Court and to the National Assembly, and nothing happened. And we get increasing re re reports, and we're overstretching our own services and blaming them for matters that are well beyond their you know, compass. OK, look at um, Hong Kong Su has promised to recruit 750,000 um, um, personnel for national security. Fantastic. But does he have inventory of the number of institutions for training? Is he aware, for instance, that the NDA cannot train 200 in one stretch? Is he taking account of attrition? How many officers are we losing on a regular basis, on a daily basis, and are they being replaced quickly enough? And so you find that for somebody to be talking at this we are of the election, about recruitment being the solution, I see that the full appreciation of the real crisis is not on the table. And this is not personal to Concord, so it cuts across just like we've been mm. talking about the manifestos. So looking at us moving towards 2023, some of the things to worry about is the question of increasing insecurity. INEC facilities are still being destroyed. Will INEC be able to reconstruct, produce new PVCs? Are we going to have a great number of disenfranchised Nigerians because of unrest? The worries are several, and they percolate around one central point. The Nigerian state is no longer showing capacity, the capacity to protect itself, to stand as the major source of force. If you like, you know, the state is the, they say, say to be the primary uh, holder of the forces of terror. The Nigerian state today is only one competing source of coercion among several others. And we're working towards an election, and we're looking at an environment where people get away with things that sh they shouldn't get away with. Our president was shot at on his way to Kaduna. So as we move into January, chances are that people will say, oh, this government is already out. Are we going to have warlords? As is beginning to emerge in some other parts of the country. My fear is that. Yes, the greater national consciousness I imagine is that, look, more Nigerians want a new president. Right. But that's different from saying that the environment is under sufficient control to guarantee okay. that. Um, well, Waziri Adia, we've got a couple of minutes left on the program, so you're probably going to have the, uh, the last word. But coming, um, just listening to the rather pessimistic but realistic 
analysis from both Professor Ikechuku that we just heard and Professor uh, Ibrahim. What, what is your take? Will it be a lost world in 2023, a voyage into a new political world for Nigerians in 2023, perhaps more optimistic, or, or, or a, a new golden age, as one of the candidates has suggested, or is it just an imagined world? Okay, I think um, the election will hold. Um, it doesn't mean that there will be pockets of uh, incidents here and there. Um, I have um, a very strong confidence in the electoral management body. And I think we all should do that. You know, um, yes, there are some concerns about uh, insecurity, uh, but at the same time, I think we need to acknowledge uh, that um, some some progress, you know, has also been made on the security front, you know, by our security forces uh, in recent times. Um, and uh, we should hope and give them the support necessary to make sure that um, uh, they continue to make more progress. Um, I also think that. Um, a president will emerge on the first ballot, uh, despite what uh, some uh, other people say. Um, um, I don't think there will be any runoff. Um, and I think uh, the election uh, will be credible, will be free and fair. Uh, whether the political actors and their supporters you want to accept the outcome uh, is a different thing. And you know we have to uh, insist that the electoral management body uh, does its job uh, without fear or favor and that the security forces provide the security cover for the election to hold, and that all the political actors uh, also behave you know, themselves. Uh, in terms of what will happen post the election, um, whoever takes over the country will inherit a difficult um, uh, country, uh, but the problems are not insurmountable. We have passed through uh, you know, darker faces uh, before as a country. So it's the, it now depends on the quality of the person that is elected. It also depends on how people respond. Uh, the job of, of uh, citizenship or the job of citizens um, does not end with going to the uh, to coming out on the day of election and casting their votes. Uh, it's a work in progress, uh, it's an eternal work. Uh, even if uh, people elect the president that um, almost all the country, almost uh, all parts of the country want. Uh, we still have to continue to hold them to account. And I also want to believe that certain things have changed in this country. People have found their voice, and uh, they will continue to demand um, uh, that, uh, that uh, the, the, uh, the, their elected representatives or their, their rulers uh, you know, do the needful by them. Uh, so I, I'm quite hopeful. Uh, it was, it's not going to be a walk in the park, uh, but it's doable. And um, I think we should just, um, we should just uh, give hope a chance. Okay. On that note, uh, I want to thank you very much indeed, Waziri Adio, and of course, uh, Professor uh, Jibrin Ibrahim and Professor Oke Ikechuku. Thank you very much indeed. That's it for this special year in review edition of Arise Primetime as Nigeria approaches the 2023 presidential election and the mouth-watering prospect of positive change after so many decades in which the world seemed so eerily dark and empty. From me and the entire team here in Abuja, best of the season to you. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.